Hello, and thank you for joining the Council of State Governments webinar, Improving Academic Success in Post-Secondary Education. Uh, I'm Tim Weldon, an Education Policy Analyst at CSG. Uh, this is the second in a series of five webinars dealing with policy issues related to post-secondary access and success. Today we have uh, three panelists who will help us understand some of the policy drivers and practices leading to uh, increased student success and retention in higher education. Uh, to begin, I'd like you to imagine pouring water into a bottle through a funnel. Now, we'd like to see every drop going uh, into the water, uh, eventually coming out the other end. But if the funnel contains holes, cracks, or other lesions, it's going to cause the water to escape before making its way out of the funnel and into the bottle. If that were the case, we would undoubtedly conclude the funnel is not effective and needs to be replaced with a new one that carries as much of the water as possible into the receptacle. Unfortunately, that's much the way our post-secondary education system works when measuring inputs and outputs. Although a higher percentage of students are enrolling in post-secondary education than ever before, that doesn't correspond to a higher completion rate. Of students who enroll in a four-year college with a goal of attaining a bachelor's degree, just over half graduate within six years. The same problem exists at two-year colleges among students who enroll with the intention of obtaining associate's degrees. It's as if the higher education funnel has sprung a leak, lots of leaks, and now we must figure out a way to fix those leaks before it's too late. Earlier this year, noted educational researcher Vincent Pinto wrote, most post-secondary institutions are not addressing student success adequately. Pinto wrote, while it is true that retention programs abound on our campuses, most institutions have not taken student retention seriously. They have done little to change the essential character of college, little to alter the prevailing character of the student educational experience, and therefore little to address the deeper roots of student attrition. As a result, he wrote, most efforts enhance, to enhance student retention, those successful to some degree, have had more limited impact than they should or could. Our panelists for today's webinar are Allison Griffin, a consultant with HCM Strategist, Dr. Scott Rawls, President of the North Carolina Community College System, and Washington State Representative Larry Sequist. Before they begin, I, I want to point out again that our audience is in listen-only mode. If you have a question for any or all of our panelists, you may submit it at any time during our webinar, and we'll get to as many questions as possible following their presentations. Allison Griffin is a consultant to HCM Strategist, an education and health policy firm in Washington, D.C. Ms. Griffin was the uh, first project manager to the college productivity work led by H HCM, funded by the Lumina Foundation for Education. The college productivity work aims to find policy solutions that will ensure our nation graduates more students more quickly with an equal or better quality of an academic credential. Uh, Ms. Griffin has spent over 15 years in the higher education policy arena having started her career serving as the Higher Education Policy Advisor uh, to the Chairman of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Education and the Workforce. Uh, Allison, let's begin with a question. Uh, why is student success and retention an issue that should lead policymakers and uh, institutional leaders to uh, stand up and take notice? Uh, uh, you know, so what if a high percentage of college students are dropping out without earning a degree or credential? Thank you, Tim. I, I appreciate being here and appreciate um, the, the question that you have led off our discussion today. So I think the first, the, the overarching question, why take interest in college completion? Um, as you so eloquently pointed out at the beginning of, of this conversation, some statistics I think are worth repeating. So just half of students who start a four-year bachelor's degree program finish um, in, in six years. Fewer than three out of ten students who started a community college full-time graduate with an associate's degree in three years. And obviously, as a result, America is slipping behind our global competitors. Um, once first in the world, America now ranks tenth 
in the percentage of young adults with a college degree. And obviously, I think we've all witnessed this in our own communities and across, across our own states, but the consequences of falling short of college completion are not just significant for once promising students, but are really severe for states in our country. Um, the current recession unemployment rates are twice as high for those with just a high school diploma um, at about 10.8% compared to those with a bachelor's degree or higher, which is 4.9% uh, currently. And so you touched on also a few of the, the many reasons why America might be falling short, but I want to highlight a, a couple of those for our listening audience. And I think it will begin to frame uh, the presentation that I'm going to make here today. So a few of those reasons why America is falling short in terms of, of college completion. Um, inadequate academic preparation, poorly designed and delivered remediation, some broken credit transfer policies, confusing financial aid programs, and really a culture that rewards enrollment instead of completion. And I think um, far, far too often a system that is somewhat out of touch with the needs of today's college students. This age-old ideal of college, going full-time, living on campus, having this residential experience, um, really only represents a quarter of today's college students. And I think that it comes down to three things. There needs to be a shared responsibility for success. Um, students have to work hard. They have to make good choices. And of course, they have to stick, stick with it, stick with the program and the, the future that they um, desire to pursue. Um, colleges and universities must make graduation, um, not headcounts, the measure of their success. And of course, they must align to the needs of today's students. And then obviously most important to our conversation today and, and to the audience we have here, um, states must really knock down obstacles across the entire educational system that unnecessarily block paths to college completion. Um, they must encourage and hold accountable institutions and students for measurable progress. As I've outlined in front of you um, some national initiatives, I just want to quickly touch on um, a few. There are many. But um, there are a few initiatives being led um, by an organization called Complete College America. There's some work being done at the foundation level by Lumina Foundation for Education and their Goal 2025 initiative. Um, of course, the, the White House, the Obama administration has been talking about some of these issues in the last four years. I expect that conversation to continue into the president's second term. And the work that you mentioned um, at the, with my introduction, the, the productivity work. Um, that's managed in large part by our firm in Washington. Um, goals for completion, um, they've been established, again, at the national level. I think they've, um, they've been endorsed by foundations. They've garnered the support of policy analysts and, and policy thinkers from across the country. And obviously, this work is now starting to trickle down into the state level. So if we could move on to the next slide, I will talk about three policies that I believe um, have a, a, play a significant role in reducing um, the time to completion for, for students and therefore um, help move them through the educational pipeline uh, more quickly and obviously towards um, a degree or a credential of value. And the three policies that I want to talk about today are controlling credit creep by limiting program length, establishing model two year or four year semester by semester roadmaps for all programs, and then guaranteeing the transfer of general education curriculum. Um, if we could move to the next slide, we can um, dive into the first one, which is controlling credit creep by limiting program length. Um, now to start off this conversation, I think we have to have a a fundamental understanding that for many years in credit terms, the standard for a bachelor's degree was 120 hours. For an associate's degree, it was 60 hours. So on the calendar, that's four years of full-time attendance for a bachelor's and two years for an associate's degree. And really, in the past generation, credits and time have started to creep up. Um, it's interesting to note that in 1972, a high school graduate could expect to complete a degree with an average of about 130 credits in a little over four years. 
When the class of 1992 entered college 20 years later, that total had risen to 138 credits, or well over four and a half years. Obviously, we're you know well um, almost 20 years past 1992, um, and those st statistics have continued to go up. Nationally, it's really more than 60% of bachelor's graduates take longer than four years, and close to 30% take more than six. Um, part of this obviously has to do with students, both the things that they can't control and the things they can. Uh, they come to college somewhat ill-prepared or ill-informed and fail or repeat courses. Of course, we know they work part or full-time jobs, often out of necessity, and they're changing their majors. Um, you know, they choose to stay in longer than they have to, whether for academic, social, or economic reasons. But we also see that institutions are contributing, um, sometimes intentionally and sometimes um, by neglect, and they allow degree requirements to creep upwards. So as we begin to look at this issue of credit creep um, and a possible strategy to address this, this issue, one state we might look to is Florida. Um, they actually surveyed 100 colleges and universities around the country to see how program requirements in their state university system stacked up against their peers nationwide, and they found wide variation in most program areas. Um, they uh, took on an initiative that really within less than a year reviewed 600 programs around the state um, and reduced 300 of those program requirements. Um, by the end of the process, 500 out of the 600 programs were at 120 hours. Many of those remaining 100 were shorter than they had been when the process started. Um, I think at that time, the University of Florida was actually the, the largest university in the state, and the average degree requirements for their graduates dropped by about six credits. Um, and that doesn't sound like much, but with 9,000 graduates a year, the change translated to almost 56,000 credits annually, and the that being the equivalent of more than 400 additional four-year degrees with the same level of enrollment. Um, I noted California on this slide. I want to be respectful of our time um, this afternoon. I will leave that as an example, and we can have a further conversation about that if, if we choose to at the end of the, the session. You wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide. I want to touch a little bit on, on the second strategy, which is establishing model four-year or two-year semester-by-semester roadmaps for all programs. Of course, as we all know, probably from our own college experience, the range of options and choices in a typical online college catalog is nearly overwhelming for students. There's really no sense of which courses to take when, leaving students and their parents, of course their advisors and faculty members, really trying to reinvent the wheel every time they create a schedule for a student. And so one of the best ways to reduce students' time to degree and likely improve the odds of their success is to ensure that the courses that they take are the ones that they need to stay on track to finish their degree. Um, many institutions over the last 10 to 15 years have transformed the way students are advised so that they can only register for courses that are consistent with a degree plan. And a lot of institutions have actually made extensive use of technology um, to make this possible. But technology is really just a means to, the, to an end in this process. And it's primarily about good academic planning and communication between the college and university officials and the students, their faculty, the academic advisor. And the starting place for creating that good system is really a clear and sequential term-by-term -term outline of what a typical student's course load should be. Um, now, this seems a little like common sense, but it's really not a common practice on many college and university campuses. Um, I would argue there are a handful of best practice schools, um, Arizona State University, the University of Florida, uh, CSU Northridge, and Illinois Valley Community Colleges, um, Illinois Valley Community College. It's not a system, it's just one institution. But those four institutions might be ones that, that this audience um, would be interested in, in looking at as some prime examples of institutions that have really set out these semester-by-semester -semester roadmaps for their students. I'd like to move on just to the, the third strategy. Um, 
guaranteeing the transfer of general education curriculum. Um, more than half of bachelor's degree graduates have attended multiple institutions, and problems transferring credit when students move from one institution to another have become a major source of delay. I know many states have attempted to make transfer relatively seamless by requiring certain forms of transfer or providing admission guarantees to community college graduates. But transfer arrangements in the 50 states really range from more or less of an ad hoc um, to a highly centralized system. So they vary greatly. Um, there have been some initiatives. Again, I used Florida as an example. I also noted North Carolina. and. Um, I'm hopeful that, that we can learn maybe a little bit more, um, Dr. Rawls, about what, what you've done um, through the North Carolina system, but also Texas as, as three examples um, of some comprehensive systems that some either employ common statewide course numbering, um, associate degree transfer guarantees, transferable general education, um, Let's see common major prerequisites and common standards for acceleration of credit. Um, a lot of these different practices are in place in, in a number of different states, but um, I would argue that these three states have been um, somewhat comprehensive in the way that they have addressed the transfer of general education curriculum. Um, two other states to note, however, are Iowa and Washington State. Um, and Representative Sequest I'm, I'm might be interested to, to hear your perspective on this. Um, in Washington State and Iowa, I know that the guarantee of the transfer of general education curriculum for students who have completed their entire associate's degree then allows those students to transfer with that associate's degree um, to a four-year program knowing that they don't have to do any more gen general education coursework um, at that senior institution. So it's definitely worth um, looking at how we can, can use this general education curriculum transfer policy as a way, obviously, to move students through the pipeline uh, more quickly towards degree attainment. On my last slide, I just provided some additional resources um, for some of the organizations that I mentioned at the top of this talk and um, some additional reading materials that I think might be helpful um, to this audience as we dive into some of these policy issues more deeply. And with that, um, Tim, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Scott Rawls, the president of the North Carolina Community uh, College System. Uh, in 2010, uh, the North Carolina Community College System uh, set out to determine um, what policies and practices uh, its more than 50 community and technical colleges uh, had implemented to increase student success uh, during a listening tour to uh, each of the institutions in the state system. Uh, President Rawls and his team crisscrossed the state, meeting with uh, college administrators, faculty, uh, staff, and students. Uh, in the end, Dr. Rawls, as I understand it, yeah, you walked away with more than 200 best practices tied to student success, access, and excellence. And uh, today, Dr. Rawls is here to share with us uh, the steps being taken in North Carolina to increase student success in uh, the community college system. Dr. Rawls? Thanks, Tim. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I, I am describing a, a process for us. It's still a, a growing process, a dynamic process. It's a strategic planning process, but I say that as someone who, over time, began to, to load the traditional strategic planning model and working with our State Board of Community Colleges convinced them that we might focus in a different way in terms of strategic planning. Uh, we reached a milestone. Uh, we were approaching our 50th anniversary. Uh, I was new as the system president. It was time, for, in many people's viewpoints, for a new strategic plan, but strategic planning has, in my opinion, often been uh, static, uh, not as dynamic. It often, the, the goal had been to produce a document that was to influence uh, for what it, for us is a very big system. We're 58 colleges that serve one out of every eight adults in our state. And so we, we asked and, and worked with our state board and with also representatives from our local trustees from colleges and our college presidents that let's have a strategic focus. Let's set a strategic focus on student success and program completion and create a dynamic process to 
determine the ways in which we can, both as individual colleges and as a system, influence that over a period of time. So we began in October of 2009, and if you can go to the next slide, we defined what we meant by our guiding goals. Uh, the first goal, and the primary goal, was to increase student success, to increase the number of students, and number is a very important word here, increase the number of students leaving with a job-ready credential. Uh, this is also important, so we didn't say it had to be an associate's degree or a diploma or what we sometimes traditionally think of as our academic degrees, a job rate credential that can lead to becoming a successful employee or employer in a global economy and provide for better skills, better jobs, better pay, and continued educational attainment. Now our goal was to increase the number of our students, the number of our citizens in our state who are successful through program completion that leads to a meaningful job rate credential. And so our state board said, well, if we're going to do that, we need to make sure that we don't take the easy way out. In other words, we could perhaps increase student success on a percentage basis by just limiting access, but that wouldn't have an impact on our state in terms of the number of people who need the credentials they, they need to, to work in our state and to thrive in our state now. Another easy way out would be we could just lower the bar. I mean, if we want more degrees, we can get more degrees if we lower the bar and just push out more degrees, but that's why we also had to focus very much on, on program excellence, particularly in the climate we live now. So that were our, those were our three guiding goals that were established for us. And as a process, we said in starting this, let's begin not by pulling a few folks who you know, may have some ideas and saying what we should do for an entire system, but let's go to the entire system. Let's listen to the folks who are on the ground who are trying to make a difference and find out what's getting in their way, what's some of the barriers, what are some of the things that they're doing locally, find out both their challenges and their opportunities. And so for a, a little over six months, uh, we traveled over 13,000 miles to our 58 colleges with our board members and leaders from our system office. And we listened to leaders from the colleges. Uh, we had students that participated. We had trustees. And we asked them to, to tell us what are their best practices in furthering student success. And that produced the, the, the database, if you will, of 200 that, that's out there. And if you go to our website, successnc.org, you will find uh, descriptions and contacts for each of those that we documented, as well as documenting the barriers that our colleges indicated that they were running into that were preventing student success. Some of those barriers were not directly related, but there were a lot of processes that they went through that weren't value added, that took time away. And so we documented those as well. And you can find that on the same web page. Now, as part of that process, it also influenced the definition for us of success. And if you'll go to the next, to the next uh, slide. And for our sector, I think community colleges, this can be a great challenge for us because the federal definition of success, what we call the IPED definition, it's actually something we don't pay a whole lot of attention to because, to be honest with you, it's, it does, it's not as relevant enough a measure for us. For instance, in our community college system, 21% is our graduation rate, but that's for full-time, first-time students, which is only 27% of our population. Most of our population is part-time uh, because they're working students. The other thing is there are other ways in which students succeed but are not captured. And just to give you a couple of examples that we heard as part of the listening tour at that time or at that point in time, uh, one was a student who was the valedictorian from NC State University at about that time. He was one of our non-completers because as we looked at our data, most of our students transfer to a university uh, before they will complete an associate's degree. Only a quarter of our students who complete an associate's degree uh, or students who transfer complete an associate degree, but we have to look at what courses and what preparation those students are taking before they actually transfer. And so looking at that as a definition of success, on one of our trips uh, to the far west in the mountains, uh, one of the uh, welding instructors, one of our most phenomenal instructors, said, I know you're looking at all our completion numbers. And if you looked at our program, this was a program of 150 students, he said, if you look at our numbers from last year, you know we had a 6% completion rate. But he said, I need to give you some supplemental data. And he produced a stack of pay stubs and put them on the desk and said, here's the pay stubs for all our students. Because the students were gaining very valuable certifications way before they would complete an associate's degree or certi certification that may lead to academic success completion, but gaining jobs all around the world. In fact, one student was making 
six figures after a couple of years and coming back. So it broadened our sense of what success was, but what we had to make sure is we didn't take the easy way out. Because too often, because we don't really put a whole lot of stock in the federal definition of success for community colleges, it leads to an easy way out where we don't pay enough attention to success at all. We've only paid attention to access, and access does not cut it in the world in which we're living now. So that's why we set a new student success target to increase the percentage of students who transfer to a university, successfully transfer, and or complete a meaningful credential and to raise that rate from a 45% baseline to a 59% baseline over a 10-year period. Doing so, we calculated, would allow us to double the number of credentials that we produce. Now, in working through that process, uh, we're, we've been helped quite a bit through our relationship with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, that relationship started early in our state and with community colleges through our work with early colleges. We sponsor one-third of all the early college high schools in the United States or in North Carolina. The vast majority are on our campuses. So we had an early relationship with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation even before they began their post-secondary success effort. As they define their post-secondary success efforts, so they, they create a framework based on the notion of connection, entry, progress, completion with different milestone points, different definitions. And as we began to gather the best practices and hear the challenges from our colleges, that also defined for us the, the big places we as a system need to pay attention. And in that framework, we use that as a framework uh, for the basis for the, the initiatives that we were creating, which were primarily based on things that were already happening local and or data that was also driving us to say these are the places that are either losses or momentum points, places we can accelerate student success, but places where we're very much losing perhaps students along the way. The first place then being connection, what happens before students actually um, move to us. So if you'll turn to the, to the, to the next uh, slide, you'll see connection, and that has our initiatives on connection that are highlighted. Uh, just as a couple of points here, uh, Basic Skills Plus. Many of our students in North Carolina uh, come through our GED and our adult literacy programs, which in North Carolina are part of our community colleges. But what we found, uh, actually through a question that Bill Gates asked when he was visiting us here one day, is looking at students who completed a GED, where did they go next? Well, oftentimes they went into developmental education, remedial education. Uh, most often they didn't finish a credential, so we decided we needed to figure a way to create a program that allowed them to gain technical skill, vocational skill, as well as moving developmental education opportunities into those GED programs such that when students complete, they are college ready. That was one part of connection. Another part of connection is what we do with high school students. Uh, we have a very, uh, we had had a very, I would say, liberal, robust um, dual enrollment program where high school students could take college courses for free through community colleges in North Carolina. What we found, though, is that oftentimes those courses, they were repeating over and over, uh, particularly in the 12th, 11th grade years electives and, and social science credits. They weren't completing math courses. They weren't completing science or English. And so we created pathways with our public schools. And that was a big definitional phrase or, or a big theme you'll see throughout our efforts. It's not so much about students taking courses, but having very defined pathways that allow them to move forward. Too, we had too much horizontal motion, if you will, among students and not enough movement towards an actual uh, credential. And we tied those in as well uh, with our career technical efforts. And so students taking courses in high school that articulate to courses uh, in our community colleges along very well articulated pathways. And that's what we call career and college promise. If you turn to the next point, entry, that's what happens in that, really when you think about the first semester of a community college. And when we looked at the data, that's where we lost most of our students was in that early at those first 12, 15 credit hours. The big place for us here has been in developmental education, or what some would refer to as remediation. Uh, we had two-thirds of our students, uh, both those who were coming out of high school and then those who were coming from industry, beginning in developmental education. But too, way too few of our students were actually completing their developmental or moving forward to college credit. In fact, if we look at our high school students, 40% of our students were placing into pre-algebra math, but only 8% were ever moving forward and completing a college course. And that was totally unacceptable. So our developmental education initiative was a statewide effort to 
align assessment with the public schools, which we worked toward, uh, and we did, uh, to redesign our curriculum. We pulled together our, uh, so we asked for our best math faculty across the state and, and also English faculty to redesign our curriculum in much more of a competency-based, one-year limited time frame. Doing that, having actually very descriptive competencies that the faculty accepted and defined, then we're able to go to a national test developers to develop a diagnostic-based instrument for us in terms of how we place students into more modular level courses. And the next place is to totally redefine our placement, using a lot of focus on how we tie in grade point average as well as diagnostic assessment and making more accurate placements for our students. Progress, if you'll turn to the next thing, there you see a couple of things. One of the things I would point out is our minority male mentoring program, which was an initiative that began before we actually started Success NC. We have 46 colleges that have very specific uh, mentoring programs for minority males, not because, not because we treat any one group of students uh, more, better than others, but when we looked at the data, and we always would go back to data, it was our minority male students that were having the greatest struggles in terms of student success and completion. And so our minority male program is very much a coaching model program now to focus on a segment of our student population that the data indicates is clearly struggling the most. And as part of progress is, re is setting up our, our pathways, if you will, both career technical pathways and while the previous uh, presentation gave us uh, uh, support for a strong articulation arrangement with the UNC system that we have. What we've also found, though, is an issue that was raised in the previous presentation, is we need more guarantee of general education credit transfer. In other words, too often students were transferring to uh, universities and their credit was counting as elective credit if they did not meet our 44 core threshold, which was what our articulation was based upon. So we're working very closely with the UNC system to redefine that gen ed core for universal course transfer. In fact, uh, the president of the UNC system left here about 30 minutes ago. We were working on this this morning. We've also, through what we called our Code Green Super SIP, redeveloped our career technical areas, particularly for technicians, to allow a more structured, efficient model that also allows for stackable certification, which allows students to exit perhaps sometimes out of a program with a meaningful certification or to come back into a program and gain credit for the skills that they may have gained through a non-credit or other type of program. And finally, if you'll turn to completion, and here you'll see what we refer to as our data initiative. One of the big lessons for us during this whole period has been that We've been swimming in data for years. We've had lots of data, and we produce lots and lots of reports that lead to lots of metrics. But truthfully, paying attention to the important things, the, the big loss and momentum points, it was bypassing us. Because while we had lots of data, and we were doing lots of reports, our analysis was very weak. And so we are restructuring our entire collection of data, our data integrity, meaning that the, how we uh, make sure that our data is consistent across the 58 college uh, system, but also using advanced analytics in partnership with uh, the SAS uh, Institute, which is the largest private software company in the United States, uh, experts in data mining, which is just right down the road for us, who is uh, providing significant pro bono uh, support for us in developing what we think will be a system for student success, data mining and analytics which over time we think will allow our colleges to be able to get at the granular level to actually look at student success and capture things that we felt were missing before. And finally, if you go to the bottom, the last, you'll see some cross-cutting areas that uh, they cut across all the different pieces, connection, entry, progress, completion, but are, are fundamental to our student success efforts. Well, one is an effort we have with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called Completion by Design, a cadre of five colleges in North Carolina that are essentially our prototype colleges, big, small, eastern, west. But as we attempt to try out new things, not just doing it with one college or one program, but across five colleges, and truly the other thing that's much more dynamic is the fact that you have faculty from five colleges that on a very intense and regular basis are breaking down the entire process 
uh, the, looking at even more deeply than we've been able to through just the, the statewide initiative to pinpoint areas of loss and momentum for students and to rethink how we're doing it across institutions. And we have a process through which we work through the 58 colleges to use those prototype sites to play out through our entire system. And finally, tying in performance measures and performance funding. Uh, through this process, we had to rethink what measures were most meaningful to us in terms of student success. Because truthfully, a lot of the measures we were using did not illustrate loss and momentum points. And so we had a committee that spent a great deal of time of defining what we would call the grade eight for right now, those specific measures that we look to that help inform us about student success, not just an overall completion number, but milestone points along the way. And those will be rolled into an overall data analytics process that will have other measures as well. But these are the ones that we use to hold ourselves accountable, not just final completion, but the important milestones that lead to completion. And working now to tie in uh, newer forms of performance funding to incentivize those important measures. So it's been quite a journey. It started with a, literally a journey around the state with, uh, with uh, visiting each of our campuses, collecting the best practices, understanding the challenges that our, our colleges face, trying to knock those barriers out of the way but working across a system of 58 colleges that have lots of experts in each of those systems and, and trying to organize them in a way to deal with you know, what have been the great challenges within our community college system towards moving more students, not just through our registration lines at the beginning of the year, but across our graduation stages at the end of our years. So that's been our student success effort. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Rawls, and I, I know no discussion of student success would be complete without bringing up the subject of remedial or developmental education, and I'm sure we'll uh, have a question for you about that in our question and answer uh, uh, segment. Uh, again, I do want to remind our listeners, if you have a question, please uh, submit it um, using the box on your screen. Uh, we will uh, ask your questions following our final uh, presentation. Uh, we'll now hear from Washington State Representative Larry uh, Larry Sequist, uh, first elected in 2006, Representative Sequist serves as the chair of the House Higher Education Committee in Washington State. Uh, he also serves on the House Education Appropriations and Oversight and Ways and Means Committees. Uh, a former U.S. Navy warship captain and a Pentagon strategist, he commanded four warships, including the battleship USS Iowa. Uh, Representative Sequist is a frequent lecturer and writer conducting uh, advanced seminars on innovative community and uh, security strategy at uh, Harvard, Stanford, George Washington, and American universities, uh, military colleges, and uh, Evergreen State College. Uh, he has published uh, numerous opinion pieces in the Christian Science Monitor and other papers. Um, Representative Sequist, uh, let me begin by asking this question. Uh, how do you see the role of state legislatures? Uh, what is the role of state legislatures in adopting and implementing policies that will increase student success and retention in post-secondary education? Is there a role for legislators, uh, legislators in, in taking actions that will lead to greater retention rates? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I would say absolutely yes. Of course, all legislators think that the legislatures are terribly important. But it's important, I think, to recognize that of all of the various political or uh, public policy levers, it is in education where a legislature's policy and budget tools really have an impact. We can talk about creating jobs and doing other things, but I do think that legislative focus on education uh, practices, especially in the higher education area, really have uh, an important role. So. Before I go ahead and discuss these uh, two ideas that I'd like to outline, things that we're using here in Washington State, uh, let me briefly give a little context. I, and I've already learned a great deal from our other two speakers here. I've got some notes to take for action as soon as we reconvene the legislature. Our state is one with uh, an unusually high proportion of community colleges. We've got 34 community and technical colleges, six state universities, two of whom are research universities. So compared with many states, we're a little smaller on the four-year side and a little larger on the two-year side. 
We also have a very robust uh, private uh, nonprofit university sector here. We are a state as an economy, which is an extremely high-tech economy. This is true of everybody, but it's really true for us out here in Washington State. We're the home of Boeing, Microsoft, the Gates Foundation, Costco. We've got more than 500 aerospace industries that feed Boeing. We've got a biotech uh, industry here. Our agriculture, we're the leading agriculture export state, uh, and our agriculture is also very high tech. You cannot even work in a, in a vineyard or an orchard without a certificate. We've got community colleges that teach uh, vineyard or orchard skills out of trailers in the field. So we're a very high-tech state, but the interesting thing, and that leads back to the point of this seminar, we're actually out here in Washington State an undereducated state. We are 40.9% of our 25-year-olds have a two- or four-year degree. Our attainment is only 40%, and it's going down. So even though our employers are very hungry for high-tech degrees, everything from short-term certificates, one-year certificates, two- and four-year degrees, and high-end uh, graduate degrees, uh, we've got employers asking for twice as many graduates as we are able to produce. But we're stuck. We're, we're delivering, but we are not meeting the need that we need to have out here. And that leads to our interest. So if you'd go ahead. Uh, attempt to that next slide. Let me introduce two things. Uh, we've put more detail on these slides uh, for people who look at these later. I'm going to talk to you briefly about the Student Achievement Initiative and then a little bit more about where we are in our four years with something we're calling the dashboard. Next slide, please. This chart shows the results of what we call the Student Achievement Initiative. Starting several years ago, looking at this problem of momentum uh, that you've just heard about, we've created a system that has an incentive award to each community college, each college at five basic points across the uh, student's experience from basic skills up through actually getting a degree or a certificate. Each student gets a point for every momentum point. And this chart shows that from our baseline seven years ago, what we've accomplished with that. The money involved here is actually quite small, but when you travel around and talk to our community college faculty, they are all very mindful of whether or not they're, they're accumulating points. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, the total change from the baseline, you'll see that overall, compared with our baseline through last year, we've had a 46% increase in certificate and degree completion. We've had a 23% increase in total points, meaning we're getting more bang out of this than we're even putting into it. The other curious thing, and we don't have time here to really dive into it, but on the lower left side, you'll see some negative numbers where we're actually showing declines, like in total headcount. Uh, we've begun to see, partly because of higher tuition, partly because of a slight increase in the economy, a slight reduction in headcount at our community colleges. And secondly, because we've been successful in moving people forward, we're seeing a, a small a reduction in the amount of basic skills training. Still a long ways to go there. But again, what happens in this Student Achievement Initiative that we've been offering, operating for several years is a momentum point is accumulated for every student who passes this waypoint. And at the end of a year, the school acquires a few hundred thousand dollars. The total pot here to be split is only a few million. And that money goes into the school's baseline. So it's a net gain for the school. Let's go to the next slide. 
here's again what we're trying to do with that and it really does work this has been highly successful our faculty our administrators the governor and the legislators are all aware of our community college uh, making progress this way let's skip quickly to then our four-year uh, institutions what we've just finished, it was the 1st of December when the dashboards went live. On the bottom of the screen, you can see a link to the dashboards. As I said, we've got six universities, two research and four regional uh, comprehensives. Each of them has independently negotiated with the governor. Uh, they were actually all in the same room at the same time. but that each university has negotiated with the governor a set of performance metrics. You can see the, the various parameters that are listed. And if you'd like to shift to the next slide, please. Uh, we started collecting that data last year, and it is, as I said, now up as of the 1st of December. And the information on here is for those who would like to read this uh, when they come behind us for future use. Let's go on to the next slide. We have also, as a result of our focus on STEM or, or ready to hire, high demand uh, um, skill areas, have really pressed ahead with this high tech uh, state. We are actually, as you can see in that slide, producing about 35% more baccalaureates in these high demand fields uh, compared with our general back growth. Still probably not enough. Let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about where we are now. This chart, just to remind, compares Washington on the left with, uh, as you can see in the brown, a disproportionate, or we think it's a, a happy proportion. Uh, we've got a lot of strength in our community and technical college system. And of our four-year graduates, 47% of our four-year degrees come from the two-year system. About one-third of our two-year students are headed for a four-year degree. And then let's finish up by jumping to that next slide. We've been able to achieve that at the full years ago, we were actually in the first slot. Um, we net out as a high performance uh, state. I still think 41% is way below what our economy needs. Our economy needs people to be uh, coming out of school and going into our ready to hire jobs much faster than they are now. So looking at that, uh, where we are now is a highly intense community college system with a high-tech uh, four-year cap on that, but not producing enough graduates to feed our economy. Here's what's ahead for us. First of all, I think we need to surge. We need to, we need to ask for the next few years. Our community college, our uh, workforce development, apprenticeship programs, and our four years to stuff every possible student through our system as, as we can get. Uh, we're asking that without waiting to build new buildings, uh, let's hire the faculty, let's really spool up, press the pedal to the metal on how much we can do. We've got to attack cost. Clearly we've got to bring the cost down. That's going to put the legislature into a real struggle about the money to cut the cost of tuition. Like many other people, we have had to uh, increase tuition to cope with lowering state support for uh, our schools, although we have been able to increase uh, student, state need grant for students. And we've got to really improve participation. Our low income uh, population, our minority students in Washington state, nearly half of all of the one year old children in this state live in Latino families. We have 
are under uh, um, economically disadvantaged families are disproportionately not going to two and four year colleges, <coughs> I believe that we really have to work hard starting now to make sure that those people in our state fully participate in this high tech economy. So that's what's ahead for us. And we're expecting to continue to fund the student achievement uh, initiative. I will upgrade the or redo the performance dashboard. We'll revisit that. I think it's roughly right. We'll take a look at it again. But then we need to ask ourselves, both in what Scott was calling the weekly pipeline uh, problem, all those leaks, and just play moving more people through faster. That's a real urgent need for us out here in Washington State. And with that, let's go to, to uh, I can finish my section of this discussion. I'd like to thank our staff, Maddie Thompson and Tara Rose, who helped put these slides together. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Representative Sequest, and uh, thanks to all of our panelists. We have uh, about 10 minutes left for some Q&A. Uh, Allison, let me uh, let me begin by asking you something, since uh, you're, you mentioned uh, digital uh, learning. Um, lately, we've been he uh, hearing and reading quite a bit about uh, massive open online courses, uh, better known as MOOCs, and how they have the potential to transform higher education. Uh, we're seeing a lot of movement in the, the online learning uh, arena. Um, can you connect the dots for us and, and tell us um, uh, what role you see digital learning playing in increasing student success? I actually see it. Um, it's actually already transformed the way we deliver education to students um, across our states and across our country. It's interesting. I know, Tim, in, in the introduction of me, you noted that I had spent some time in Washington um, working on Capitol Hill. And it was in 2001 when we started talking about changing some of um, the, the federal laws to accommodate the anticipated explosion in online learning. And as you can imagine, if you think back to 2001, we were in a very different place um, technologically than we are today. And there was um, expected, but um, there was uh, considerable resistance um, to even imagining that there would be an institution that would offer more than 50% of its courses online. And so, you know, that was, you know, 2001, so we're talking 11 years ago um, when we really started laying the groundwork for, for the anticipated um, growth in online education. Obviously, if we look at today, um, we are definitely witnessing not only the growth and explosion, but I think really the, almost this sense of normalcy in terms of um, students' abilities to connect um, with an educational program online. I think it's almost um, an expectation that there's an ability for a student, regardless if they're, you know, our traditional um, residential student, if they're an adult learner, if they're a community college student, if they're um, earning a, a credential or a certificate um, through a, a vocational training program, there's just this, this expectation that they will be able to connect to the information that they need and the community that they need to be involved with um, in some way through technology. Um, I, you know, I, I find it almost um, unimaginable um, thinking about my own kids who are five and three and what higher education will look like when they um, begin to pursue education beyond high school. Um, and what the, I think, what technology and what, what the Internet has afforded us to do. Now, with all of that being said and the opportunity that that creates, I still think that we need to ensure some degree, um, if not the same or better, quality of, de of academic um, uh, credential um, that is being delivered through an online program, whether that's one course or an entire um, degree, I think that we need to um, hold those programs and courses to the you know, to the same academic standard as we are holding our traditional classroom course experience. And Tim, if I could add just briefly on the uh, the use of the technologies. 
I think for me right now, it's less a matter of us coming up with legislative policies or making decisions. The technology is arriving very rapidly, day by day, as I travel around our classrooms. I'm really impressed by all of the interesting things the faculty and administrators are inventing, and the students are inventing constantly. So what I'm looking for out here in Washington State is some money that we can use as, as an innovation fund and let these people uh, invent things and give them a little cash to help uh, invent new things in the classroom. They're, they're going to take us a long way. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rawls, we, we have a question that uh, has been, uh, been brought to our attention for you, but uh, maybe uh, better ask of, of Representative Sequist. Let me ask you, Dr. Rawls, does North Carolina, has North Carolina implemented performance funding for post-secondary education? Well, yes and no. We have had a performance funding system for over a decade. Um, okay. However, the way our performance funding was provided through that is based on the availability of carry forward funds each year. So uh, we have performance measures. Our colleges are great on performance. In some years, they, they do have performance funding, but in most years, they do not, particularly bad years. So that 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 in that regard, it creates a not a very strong performance funding system because of the irregularity of the funding. And so that is okay. something we're attempting to address now through this next legislative session uh, by connecting uh, new measures to a new performance funding system. Okay. Uh, well, the question for Dr. Rawls, and uh, I know Washington also has a performance funding system, uh, but the question is, has North Carolina's performance funding been used long enough for a college to face uh, potential loss of funding from one year to the next? Again, our, our funding has not been of uh, significance enough, uh, particularly in terms of its regularity, to have a college um, uh, feel a loss of funding as a result of that. Um, however, I will say this, it has been very meaningful, and I think uh, the representative pointed out uh, the the, the process itself, having measures and having the potential of funding has promoted quite a, a focus in that regard over time. And now we've changed our focus in terms of the measures. And I, I would uh, I, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't note that Washington uh, has probably served as the, the model for, for many states like ours and how we've set up new, new models and measures. Okay. Um, I, I do want to touch upon, uh, we're running out of time, but I did want to touch upon one issue uh, or get the, Dr. Rawls to elaborate on this. Um, Dr. Dr. Rawls, can you elaborate on the developmental education initiative that you described earlier? Uh, what was involved in redesigning that curriculum? Well, uh, redesigning the curriculum was one of four key pieces in terms of developmental education redesign. Uh, Essentially, beforehand, we had a very loosely defined curriculum, and it could take up to uh, four semesters, if you will, for students, two years in developmental education. No student comes to a community college or any college to, to go into developmental education. So the goal is to get students in and out and be much more prescriptive of the specific, particularly in math, but also in language arts as well, in terms of what the students need so they can start a college-level class. So we pulled... I think the key point for us is we pull together faculty nominated from colleges across the state, gave them a huge challenge of saying this is a curriculum that can take a student no more than one year. It needs to be modular in its context, agnostic, and we need to be very clear about what the competencies are so they don't overlap course to course or, or overlap with a gatekeeper or the college level math or English. And they did that. And so it, it it's had great faculty acceptance because the faculty are the ones who decided the competency to develop the curriculum after we gave them the challenge. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Well, listen, um, we have uh, run out of time. I do want to thank our panelists for uh, taking time to uh, participate in today's webinar. Uh, Allison uh, Griffin, a consultant with HCM Strategies. Uh, Scott Rawls, the president of the uh, North Carolina Community College System and uh, Washington State Representative Larry Sequist. Uh, I want everyone to know we have recorded this webinar, and in the next few days it will be available on uh, CSG's Knowledge Center website. Uh, in February, we will continue this series of webinars. 
uh, with one examining uh, policies to promote financial access to post-secondary education. Uh, additionally, CSG uh, will offer a webinar next month titled A State Policymaker's Guide to Ensuring College and Career Readiness for All Students. Uh, we want to thank everyone who joined us for this webinar, and we hope you will register for our upcoming webinars. Uh, this is Tim Weldon. Thank you very much.